Chances are all of you have one of these in front of you. I would encourage you to pick it up and uh, make sure you get the Bible, not, not the uh, hymnal. Um, although the hymnal does look very similar. Um, it looks like it's one book. It has a front cover, it has a back cover, all these pages in between. It's called many things, uh, Word of God, Holy Bible, Bible. And it, the word Bible comes from the Latin Biblia, which, um, which means books, plural. We think of this as one book, but really it's a collection of 66 different books written by over 40 different authors on three different continents and cultures, um, in three different languages, and over a period of time of three to 4,000 years. Now I want you to let that sink in a little bit. 66 different books written over thousands of years time by different authors. If you don't think that there's different perspectives and views and opinions in here, read it again. There are statements in this book, books, that will disturb you. And if they don't, like I said, you're not paying attention. Like when it says that the Canaanites that, that, that God smashed the heads of the Canaanite babies against the rocks. If that doesn't disturb you to your bones, uh, something's wrong. Or if we see that there are people in here that are blessed who have been murderers. You knew, did you know that Moses was a murderer? Sure. There's people in here that have been very deceptive. How about the father of Israel? How about Abraham, who lied and um, mistreated, let's say, his wife Sarah? Um, there are stories throughout this book that just don't seem to add up unless you consider the context Repeat it with me. A text with no context is pretext. A text with no context is pretext. You have to read it in context. So when we have a passage like today's reading, thank you, Jack, that if you want to be my disciple, you have to hate your family. Well, that's weird, isn't it? What am I supposed to do? I sit down at dinner, and before we pass the meatloaf, I say, by the way, I have something to tell you all. I hate you. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably get the meatloaf right here. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it goes. So I want us to take a look at this. I can tell you, I'll just cut to the chase. Um, I'll tell you that there is a red thread that runs through this entire Bible. The red thread is that God yearns to have a relationship with us. Each and every one of us. Yep, even you who's thinking, Jim's not talking about me. Yes, you. God wants to have a relationship and walk through this life and give you the best life possible. That's the theme that runs through this. But how we get there, friends, it's important to understand the context. Now, this passage today is a bit weird. Okay, I hope by now I've got a bit of a consensus on that. There are other passages in the Bible that talk about polygamy, mass murder, religious intolerance, acts of genocide, adultery and deceit, but we tend to just skip over those passages and say, oh, I don't know. Ministers probably know what that is, but we don't know. Well, it's not hard to understand 
that oftentimes the images of God that are presented throughout the scriptures are very parochial. That is to say that as we read the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, that we see a God that is sort of the tribal God of Israel. And so the stories we get are stories of God protecting the people of Israel. We get a very different view of God, I think, oftentimes in the New Testament. Instead of a God of violence and war and all of that protecting the Hebrew people, we get more of a global picture of a God who loves Let's see, how'd that help me with it? How'd that go? So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. This is a God for all of us, for the whole world. And oftentimes this is different. Now you say, well, Jim, is that a conflict? Is that a paradox? Is that... Um, is that something that doesn't go together? No, it's, 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 it's talking about a God that gets developed. Our understanding of God gets developed over time. But we have a God here who is a faithful, loving God. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own family, he or she cannot be my disciple. What in the world does Jesus mean by that? Perhaps the context will be of help. Here Jesus has just left dinner with some high-ranking Pharisee. Now you talk about hate. Here's a word that works really well. The scribes and Pharisees, they hated Jesus. They hated Jesus. Why? Because Jesus kept challenging and accusing them of abusing their power to take from the common people and keep them under their thumb so that they had authority and power and wealth over them. Jesus wasn't happy about that. Jesus thought that was abusive. Jesus didn't think that was loving, and Jesus didn't think that that represented God. He was against not the scribes and the Pharisees, but he was against their practices. And that's what he wanted to change. After dinner, we're told that there was a multitude, a large crowd that followed Jesus. Why did they do that? Maybe they did it because he had fed 5,000. Maybe they were still hungry. Or maybe they had seen Jesus heal somebody and they needed their own healing to come. Probably safe to imagine that there were many motives why people followed Jesus. But few people understand. Let me repeat that. Probably a lot of motives why people follow Jesus, but few of us ever understand the cost of being a disciple. And Jesus wanted his disciples to understand this was no cakewalk. That increasing darkness on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to the cross, that was going to cost every single one of those disciples, their life. It certainly would cost Jesus his life. He wanted them to understand. And he wants us to understand. He wants us to understand that being a disciple is not to be a convenient Christian, but that it is to be one who is committed. Now, I wonder if anybody's feeling uncomfortable. Because the good reverend is. Am I a disciple? Or am I a follower? Probably depends on the day. I'm not perfect. I'm a long ways from being perfect. 
even on those days that I want to be a good disciple. I'll tell you a story. It was a few years ago, not long ago, but a few years ago, I left home on my way to a meeting, an important meeting. All my meetings were important. And this one, I, I really wanted to be on time. As I left, I could see that I was a bit behind time. So as I made my way down the road, I kept trying to figure ways that I might shave some time off of my travel time and how I might be on time. As I was doing those mental calculations, I came up over the hill and right in front of me at this intersection was a horrible accident. It was apparent to me that I was the first one on the scene. There were two cars and they had collided. One car was still in the middle of the intersection and the other one was in the ditch. Both horns were blaring and uh, the airbags had been deployed and there were two elderly people and they were, they were uh, kind of wandering around in a dazed sort of way. You know the first thing that your wonderful interim minister thought? There goes my meeting. <laughs> now I'm embarrassed to tell you that. There goes my meeting. I stopped my car, I got out, and I thought, you know, was passing by on the other side like the priest and the Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan really an option for me? And I thought, yeah, I guess I could have. But I couldn't have lived with myself if I had. And I could live with myself, but not as a Christian, is kind of what I was saying to myself. Anyway, I stopped my car, I jumped out, I tried to assess the situation as best I could, and um, I, I, I gathered might not be the right word, but I, I got the people and off to the side, out of the road, and I got them to sit down, and, and um, I called 911, I told them that we needed, we needed a couple ambulances, some police cars, a fire truck, National Guard, and, <laughs> and, and uh, that, that we had a horrible accident. They said they'd be on the way. I sat down with the, the, the two people and, and I held the hand of this elderly woman and I said, I've called for help and they'll be here shortly. I said, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. I got to thinking, boy, I feel pretty lousy thinking about my meeting, you know. Um, the horns were still blaring. And I noticed that the elderly man had a, a gash on his leg. I took my shirt off. I pressed it on his wound, thinking Christy probably would have done something like that you know, stop that bleeding. But that's about all I knew to do. And uh, I said, hang on, help's coming. And we sat there for a bit, and then after a while, I heard the sirens in the distance, you know. I could hear them coming. And sure enough, a fire truck, three police cars, and two ambulances showed up. And I thought, well, that might be enough to take over for the good reverend. I talked to the police, gave them my report, and then, and then I left. And as I drove away, I kept thinking, what was with you? Was your meeting so doggone important? And then it nailed me right between the eyes. I said, Jim, you're a follower. You're not a disciple. You're a follower. A follower is somebody who stops and helps 
if they have to. A disciple is somebody who looks for opportunities to share God's love and goodness because somebody else needs you. Oh boy. I had been ordained decades by that time, and that didn't feel very good. I thought about that for the longest time. And you know what I finally decided? I finally decided not to beat myself up about that. Because there are days, there are days that I'm a pretty good disciple. And there are other days that I'm just a follower. I think that's what it is to be human. But I'll tell you one thing. I always try to be in the game. Somewhere between being human and being blessed by God. I try to do the best I can, and I suspect that's probably true for most of us. There's a couple of you that are on the saint side, but for most of us, that's it's probably what it is that we, you know, we're followers and we're disciples, but we're growing into it. Some days we see clearly, and other days we just squint. Our sight is always 2040 at best, our spiritual sight. But we're in the game. And I figured, you know, for a God of grace, that's probably not too bad. That's not too bad. But I hope next week, next month, next year, I might be a little bit more of a disciple. I'm hoping. Probably a lot of that will depend upon what I do in this season of Lent and how I grow. And I hope that you'll grow too. Wouldn't be a bad thing. You can put your Bibles back now. Um, and may God bless you. And may God bless United Church of Marco Island. <laughs>